Paul Hackett leads a monotonous life, a plodding routine at work, followed by an uneventful routine at home. However, when Marcy strikes up a conversation with Paul at a diner over the book he's reading, he visits Marcy's apartment under the facade of wanting to buy one of her roommate's sculpted bagel paperweights, but in actuality more likely seeking a one-night stand. Paul finds that his search for something more in his life backfires as he struggles to get back home when the locals in the neighbourhood begin to suspect he's the person burgling their apartments. Everything he does seems to unravel for the worst. This is Martin Scorsese's After Hours, a stress-inducing intense cult comedy that's likely served as an inspiration for films like Uncut Gems and Bo is Afraid due to their similarly unrelenting natures. Depicting the craving for change, to live one's life, and contrasting it with the desperation for normality after experience in New York during its after hours, a time and place that seems kinky, queer and voyeuristic, but also accusatory and inescapable, depicting every action of Paul's as a source of heightened complication, becoming an exercise in the most unfortunate synchronicities. After Hours is instantly captivating in its scathing satiric bite, gripping the viewer as Paul's obstacles gradually snowball into unstoppable forces, seemingly everything acting to work against him. It's a dark, suspenseful film, with traces of the surreal that unfolds slightly within the realm of unreality. Roger Ebert's review of After Hours attempts to define the film and how its suspension of reality and its emphasis on unlikely coincidences mirrors classic cinematic comedy. What is the likelihood, for example, of Paul confronting the neighbourhood burglars Neil and Pepe at the exact moment he mistakes their removal of Kiki's screaming sculpture, something which they bought and has now been mistaken as a theft? After Hours is chock full of unexpected chances like this, gradually spiralling into heightened mishaps for Paul. In his review, Roger Ebert wrote that, critics have called it Kafkaesque almost as a reflex, but that is a descriptive term, not an explanatory one. Is the film a cautionary tale about life in the city? To what purpose? New York may offer a variety of strange people awake after midnight, but they seldom find themselves intertwined in a bizarre series of coincidences, all focused on the same individual. You're not paranoid if people really are plotting against you, but strangers do not plot against you to make you paranoid. The film has been described as dream logic, but it might as well be called screwball logic. Apart from the nightmarish and bizarre nature of his experiences, what happens to Paul Hackett is like what happens to Buster Keaton, just one damned thing after another. Paul Hackett's experiences aren't dissimilar to the misfortunes that fall upon one of Buster Keaton's many great characters. The unlikely circumstances Paul struggles through, often intermingling with terrible coincidences. While Kafkaesque does feel like an appropriate description, Paul Hackett isn't unlike Joseph K in the trial, a man facing constant chastisement that, in After Hours' case, Paul is assumed to be a burglar by the locals of a Soho neighbourhood. No matter how hard he attempts to persuade others of his innocence, he continues to face misfortune. Ebert is right to question what After Hours is truly about. Maybe there is an element of the cautionary tale within After Hours. Don't place a loose 20 in a taxi cab with the window wide open would be a good miniature lesson here. But Roger Ebert highlights later in his review that After Hours also contains a semi-autobiographical reflection on Scorsese's own frustrations with filmmaking at the time of production. In his review, Ebert wrote that Scorsese has suggested that Paul's implacable run of bad luck reflected his own frustration during the last Temptation of Christ experience. Executives kept reassuring him that all was going well with that film. Backers said they had the money. Paramount greenlighted it. Agents promised it was a go. Everything was in place and then time after time, an unexpected development would threaten everything. In After Hours, each new person Paul meets promises that they will take care of him, make him happy, lend him money, give him a place to stay, let him use the phone, trust him with their keys, drive him home, and every offer of mercy turns into an unanticipated danger. If we view Martin Scorsese's direction inspired from a source of frustration over the challenges he faced in getting The Last Temptation of Christ produced, then After Hours effectively mirrors the irritating difficulties of pre-production, the false promises, the unfortunate unfortunate coincidences impacting Scorsese's goal of producing his film, similar to the misfortune that befalls unlucky Paul in his deceptively simple goal of trying to reach home. 
Whilst Scorsese's The Last Temptation of Christ would be released three years post After Hours, this is a film that specifically reflects the exasperation of uncertainty that filmmakers face in attempting to get anything produced ever. In After Hours, the source of Paul's trouble is synchronicity, strung together coincidences that cause his increasing distress, seemingly connected or perceived to be of some great significance that isn't truly there. The minuscule chances of each event happening to Paul, only to eventually happen anyway, makes After Hours the reason it is so gripping, an unavoidable nightmare for the protagonist, in a similar way the film becomes an unavoidable well of tension for the viewer. Later in his review, Roger Ebert elaborated on the impact of coincidence within After Hours, stating that this generates the film's sinister undertone, as in a scene where he tries to explain all the things that have befallen him and fails, perhaps because they sound too absurd even to him. One thing many viewers of the film have reported is the high, some say almost unpleasant, level of suspense in After Hours, which is technically a comedy but plays like a satanic version of the classic Hitchcock plot formula, the innocent man wrongly accused. The Hitchcock comparison is that, as After Hours' constant drip of suspense through misadventure after misadventure, confrontation after confrontation, is like that of an Eon noir mistaken identity thriller or an urban escape taper. The more unbelievable the circumstances, the better the film becomes at racking up tension, raising the stakes, and making Paul sound even more unreliable. The motivation that sets off Paul's nighttime odyssey is the craving for change. It's a relatable character motivation, whether people are stuck in a job with little space for progress, or aspire for a new experience, they can find something of themselves in Paul Hackett's insipid routine. He works with little chance of moving up. Compared to the aspirations of his colleague, Paul seems tedious. He lives at home, regularly channel hopping for just about anything to fill the void. So when Paul is given the chance to connect with a young woman, supposedly for a sculpted bagel paperweight, but more likely for a consensual one night stand, he can't really be blamed. The want for change is something deeply ingrained in many people. It's in Paul's struggle to return home no matter his efforts, that After Hours contrasts that want for change with the ironic reflection on the desperation for normalcy, for structure, for the familiar. After Paul's night, he's likely to be more comfortable within the tedium of his life. During the height of his escape attempts from a growing angry mob on his trail due to suspecting him of being their neighbourhood burglar, Paul tells a woman at Club Berlin that he wants to live, which literally means not being killed by the mob, but also figuratively means that he's caught at a crossroads. He wants to live his life to the fullest, and yet he can't, and that may mean settling within what he's become familiar with. There's a bleakly contradictory yet fascinating dynamic here with Paul between what he wants, a change in life, and what he needs to return home, to sleep. His eventual escape from chaos leads him straight to the opening gates of his workplace, a return to the inescapable routine. In this Kafkaesque satire, is Paul being punished for daring to wish for something new in his life? Or is it a stark reminder that, no matter how exciting or frightening a new experience may be, we always return back to our tedious routine? A brief dance between Paul and an older artist, June, is soundtracked by Peggy Lee's recording of Is That All There Is in Club Berlin, and his song captures the crushing disappointment brilliantly of Paul's unexpected new experience, the supposed change he craved, and the plummet down to earth once he returns to work. Was any of this really worth it? Is that all there is? In conclusion, Martin Scorsese's After Hours is a masterful exercise in suspense, anxiety, and conveying his own filmmaking frustrations. It's only a bonus that After Hours manages to be hilarious too while it's at it. A relatable motivation for Paul spun into a whirlwind of mistake-making, unintentional trouble-causing, and almost constant misunderstanding. After Hours might just rattle the viewer as much as it manages to rattle a protagonist. One of the more underrated titles in his filmography, Scorsese's After Hours shouldn't be missed. A special thank you to my incredible tier Patreon supporter Gil, and to my super tier Patreon supporters Constantin Bombelli and Jamie.